we really want to democratize access to these next generation protein medicines. We want things that are as effective or more effective than antibodies, but are actually something that we can produce and administer at scale so that everyone can access it. And that's what mini proteins are allowing us to do. Three, two, one, zero. Welcome aboard the System76 transmission log. Our broadcast is about to begin. This is the latest on System76 computers, manufacturing, and Pop! OS. Now, for your in-orbit crew. Thanks for joining us. We're excited for today's episode. We have some great company announcements and a really cool guest from AI Proteins. We'll be talking about how AI is used in healthcare with the potential to make treatments more affordable. The hottest topic around the office as of late has been Nebula chassis. We've made some amazing updates to that product, and it's really now been able to come over into the Thaleo product line. It's unlocked a lot of things that a lot of our customers have been asking for for a while. We've updated our Ochwa certification now for the standalone chassis. So news from the factory, we are currently automating the production process for launch keyboards via CNC automation. This will enhance efficiency and precision. The robots now handle loading and running the mills and can account for different weights of launch parts. So this will really, really optimize the manufacturing process. And that's the news. Great. And now our interview with Chris Ball from AI Proteins. So today we have Chris Ball, the, the co-founder, chief scientific officer and president of AI Proteins. Chris, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Wanted to let our listeners know, kind of hear the origin story of AI proteins. Could you give us the background and what your mission is and what you're looking to accomplish? So we are a company that focuses on using artificial intelligence to design next generation medicines. Our mission really is to cure as many diseases as fast as possible, to create as many molecules to help as many patients. We hope to accomplish this using a, a wide array of methods that we kind of bring all together under one roof. So artificial intelligence is where all of our work begins, but we also have a wet laboratory that we use to actually make the molecules that we design and test them to see if they do what they're supposed to. And to achieve that, we combine synthetic biology with robotics and automation. And so when you bring together these three kind of amazing technologies, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology and automation all under, at the same time, really some magic can happen. That's the thesis of AI proteins. What laboratory? That's interesting. I've never heard that phrase. Is that, that just means that's where all the protein work is done? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a little bit, bit of a jargon term there. So computer science is done in a lab, but there's no fluids. So that's a, a dry lab. The wet lab is when we are using fluids. So things that are alive generally are being tested in the wet lab. And also, you know, chemistry is often done in liquids. That's cool. Do you want to talk through what de novo protein design is and how that differs from therapeutics? Right. So we focus on building protein molecules totally from scratch. So when people think about protein, I'm guessing the, the first thing that probably pops to mind is food. Totally correct. Pretty much all food has protein. Um, but it's so much more than just food. And I think... I would guess most folks have a pretty good awareness of DNA and genetics and the importance of genetics for human health, and it's your DNA that makes you who you are. But maybe not everyone is familiar with the fact that the primary function of DNA is to actually encode blueprints for building proteins. And proteins are actually nano-sized robots that mediate all of the chemistry of life. So. While that information encoding in DNA is very important, it's actually really the proteins that are on the business end of things being alive. And so if you can engineer a protein, you can manipulate and control life. All of the drugs that we have today that are made out of protein are natural proteins. But with de novo protein design, we, we are building these things. We throw out all the information from evolution, and we build new nanorobots from the ground up that don't have any similarity to things that have come before. And there's a very good reason why we want to do that. When you build something from the ground up, you have so much more control over the activity and properties than you get when you modify a natural material. 
And I think there's a very good analogy in um, the world of construction materials that I, I think is maybe helpful to understand really the impact of what this transition means. So if you think about the materials that we use to construct buildings from the dawn of humanity until pretty recently on a historical scale, we've constructed our buildings primarily out of natural materials. But we didn't get skyscrapers by building buildings with natural materials. We needed a fundamental shift in control over those materials to be able to shape them and give them the properties that we would like uh, in order to be able to make structures like skyscrapers. From the beginning of medicine until today, we've had natural material-based protein medicines. And the ability to design these from scratch is really that monumental shift into concrete and steel. And so that's the type of, of medicine that we're building. And we think it has the potential to revolutionize medicine, things that are safer, more effective, more accessible. These are molecules that are designed to be medicine. They're not designed to, and tuned by evolution over millions of years to do something else and that we can try and repurpose it into medicine. Yeah. So so with that, Chris, the... I feel like with the introduction of AI and, and the build of the way computers have really come into this field has opened the door for a lot of creativity and a lot of development at a, a faster pace than I think we've probably been able to do in the past because you're now able to use more of the dry lab in order to create, build, and test prior to having to go to the wet lab or start at the wet lab and pull from the existing system. With that in mind, how has your field's way of addressing and, and reviewing changed over the years from CPU compute and GPU compute? Because I feel like when we first started working with you, you were still with the Institute of Protein Innovation, and you guys were using one of the Jackal Pros with high core count, a lot of memory, and I think some, maybe some NVMe storage as it was becoming more the norm. But now you've got shifts towards GPU with NVIDIA's new H100, A100 series for enterprise. How has that changed the course of what you're looking to accomplish and what you're doing on a regular basis? This is a great question, Sam. There has been a monumental shift in the field of protein design that's, that's really been occurring over the last, I would say, 12 to 36 months, hmm. and it's been a very exciting time of, of really breakneck change. So maybe zooming out a little bit, why do we need compute in the first place? And the, the answer is that designing proteins is incredibly hard. It's a nano robot, and that means that it needs to function. And much like a shape of a robot fundamentally dictates the function of that robot, a protein is much in the same way. So it has a, th a three-dimensional shape that this thing has to fold into. And fold is the right word. So like I mentioned that the you know proteins are built of amino acids. It's a linear string of these amino acids. And the order in which you place those amino acids in the string causes that string to spontaneously ball up into a shape that confers function. Back to that robot analogy, we think about maybe a simple robot that a lot of people encounter daily that maybe don't appreciate is a dishwasher. A dishwasher is absolutely a robot, and it has a shape, and that shape is what gives it its function. So a protein is a robot like a dishwasher is a robot. The function is pretty simple. And when you start to string a lot of these together, that's how you can get this more sophisticated, complex function that you get in, like, living cells. Now imagine taking that dishwasher and folding it out of a single piece of metal, like origami, and you have to design the entire functional dishwasher out of one folded sheet of metal. That's sort of what designing a protein is like. It's that complicated. So this is way beyond what the human brain is capable of doing. We need very sophisticated algorithms that can take this into account. How this historically has been done is sort of a blend of physics and knowledge. So we've determined using experiments, which are also pretty cool, it's like crystallizing proteins and blasting them with high-powered x-rays and zapping them with incredibly strong amounts of electricity at cryogenic temperatures and like watching what happens to the protein. And you can, you can use that to determine the, the molecular structures of these things. So we know what a lot of protein structures look like. So over the years, the protein design field created a set of tools that could use some physics-based energy potentials. So things that we know about like how atoms have shape and you can't like 
two atoms can't exist in the same place at the same time. They push against each other. So you can have physics-based energy terms that calculate that. Mm -hmm. And then there's some knowledge-based stuff. Like we don't really understand why proteins like to adopt these particular shapes, but we see bonds often have these angles for some reason. So let's just make an energy term that says that they should be in those angles. And so that was all done primarily on CPU and a combination of poorly understood physics and poorly understood observations mixed together didn't make the field, you know, it wasn't super accurate. And so we had to test a lot of stuff and most of our things failed. A couple of years ago, folks started to apply various deep learning methods. And this is a, an era where we kind of leave the understanding behind and start to train neural nets that will understand how to manipulate protein structures to get them to do new things and to create new protein structures as well. That obviously uses a lot more GPU. And this is the shift that we're seeing. Folks might have heard about AlphaFold. This is algorithm developed originally by DeepMind. And I would say that that's really what kicked all of this off. There's a, a ton of folks that are doing great work in it nowadays, but I would say AlphaFold is really what paved the way. That's amazing, the, the full shift. So it Essentially, with CPU, there was more the human factor within it, and you were having to test, validate, and it required a lot of back and forth. And now with the GPU and, and being able to apply deep learning and, and that aspect, it's, it's allowed it to potentially run on its own with variance and learn and create and pull inferences from what you've already done and what you're, you're looking to accomplish, right? So it's amazing stuff. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's it's been pretty fun. Thinking a little bit more about the you know the human element it might be helpful just to spend a moment and and talk a bit about why proteins adopt these three dimensional shapes in the first place. It has to do with the types of chemical groups that you have in these amino acids in the string. So some of them are oily and repel water, and some of them are salty and like to be in water. Everyone can do this experiment at home, right? If you pour oil into a glass of water, it's going to separate. They're not going to go together. And you, you pour salt into a glass of water, and it will dissolve and be in the water. So a protein has salty bits and oily bits. And when you mix it in water, the protein, what it does is it, it contorts itself around and tucks all the oily bits in the interior and all the salty bits on the surface to interact with water. And that's, that's how the protein adopts its shape. That's what drives it. And all of the knowledge-based CPU calculations that we were doing were largely based on this view of how proteins work. But it's, it's limited, and it's obviously it's a lot more sophisticated. There's a lot more, there's motion, and there's sometimes there's salty bits on the inside, sometimes there's greasy bits on the outside, so it's not perfect. And the, the deep learning approaches are able to just observe a lot of different protein structures and infer how the shapes should go together. And they're also helped out by something called coevolution. While the protein field has been moving forward, all science is, today is moving forward really at breakneck speeds. I mean, it's a very exciting time to be doing any scientific research. It's, this, is a, this is a true renaissance in all areas. And in the field of genomics, people are going around and determining the, the genomes of many, many, many organisms around the world, from single-celled microbes to complicated plants and insects and mammals, you name it. And when you look in the genomes of these organisms, you can look at the proteins that those genomes encode and look at the sequences of the amino acids that are in those proteins. And by doing a sophisticated statistical analysis, you can find how the protein evolved over time. And you can also uncover bits of the protein that seem to evolve with other bits of the same protein. So these likely, these two components, if they're co-evolving, are interacting somehow in the three-dimensional structure. And so that's another layer that the deep learning approaches use uh, is more than just observing the structures directly, but also leveraging this massive amount of information about how proteins change and evolve to see that like, oh, you know, the hinge on the dishwasher always connects the door to the body. And so you start to be able to infer function for that hinge. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very neat stuff. So with that, we've had these advancements and we're jumping ahead. We're continuing forward. We're making these leaps thanks to the ability to gain these inferences and be able to look at it from not just a direct path. I feel like Linux and open source and the community aspect of that side from a software appliance is very similar to how the research community tends to go about trying to find the next 
COVID vaccine or something that pops up and we need to work on and communicate with on different levels with different entities. How is Linux and and open source able to help with what you're trying to accomplish and, and what your goal is for AI protein? Yeah, absolutely. So Linux is the foundation of our entire field. All of the software runs in Linux. We built our own little HPC. It's running Ubuntu. And you know, for the H- to manage all the HPC, we're using Slurm for the job scheduler. I mean, all of the actual infrastructure that lets us do any protein design at all is all a Linux environment. And that's true for the entire field. So that's all based off of open source software. I come from a protein design community called the Rosetta community. And Rosetta is a software package that runs in Linux. It's not open source per se, but it is free licenses for all nonprofit use and very easy to get. And AlphaFold is also fully open source. And all of this has really enabled lots of people to play with AlphaFold. So us and others routinely use it. This is a tool designed to predict the structure of proteins when you know what the sequence is, but you can hack it and run it backwards and cause it and make it hallucinate new protein structures that have never existed before. And so that's also, because the software is open source, it have enabled people to take this prediction tool, turn it on its head, and turn it into a design tool, which has been also really fun. Hmm. That's interesting about the software side. Is the scientific research treated the same as the software where it's released and open to the public? And if it is, is that something that you find your team using and accessing? Absolutely. So there's a huge controversy going around right now about scientific publishing and all of these gatekeepers that are extracting huge amounts of money and earning billions of dollars a year holding information hostage and how the scientific community is kind of revolting at this point. Wow. There's like a revolution going on and and preprint servers are a big part of that. So when scientists have a discovery, they rather than wait for the peer review process and pay thousands of dollars to a publisher and then have to have their audience pay thousands of dollars to the publisher to access that information that was that was published, you just post it to a preprint server and then everyone can see it. Hmm. And social media has also played a really important role in this. So there's a really fantastic community of scientists that use Twitter or whatever it's called now. That community is incredibly valuable. And I, I think it's it's really hard to overstate the impact that that's had in accelerating research and helping scientists communicate openly with each other. And so preprint servers, open source software repos, and GitHub is the obvious popular place for that. And social media communities where people can connect and share have all come together to accelerate all of this. And and the progress and the openness has been very exciting. And I, I hope that we'll either be able to have a stable social media community platform or, uh, you know, that can, can help that continue because... Those three components, the open source software, open, free publishing, and the online community are all equally important. To pivot a little bit, you and the rest of the founding members from AI Protein started in in academia. What led to your transition from that segment to wanting to create AI Proteins? I'm something of an evangelist of uh, de novo protein design, and in general, this type of protein that we design called a mini protein. And many proteins have the potential to solve a lot of challenges that we currently face with therapeutics, like manufacturing and speed of creation, a lot of the drug-like properties themselves. These things are are really a next-gen medicine. When I was a postdoctoral fellow with David Baker in Seattle, I had the opportunity to do the first ever de novo design of a one of these mini proteins. And I've really been chasing these things ever since and really trying to bring them to the world. So my academic lab I built a really amazing research team, and we figured out how to turn this into a high-throughput drug discovery engine while we were still in academia. And we had a, a lot of pharma companies that were interested in working with us to create new drugs. But it wasn't, I would say, until I got a phone call one day that I, I think it really, I got a sort of a kick in the pants that I wasn't doing enough. I had given some public talks and about the the promise of this. And in one of those, I had mentioned that the goal for this was human clinical trials, and that was probably a couple years away. Well, there was a a woman who had cancer and was looking for experimental therapies to try and get on it. It seems like things, unfortunately, were not going very well for her. And she stumbled across my work and somehow found my phone number. And so I'm just sitting in my office writing a grant to do the next, you know, whatever academic discovery thing. 
And I get this phone call out of the blue and I pick it up and it's this woman and she's, you know, you could, you could tell that she was really running out of options. And in academia, I think a lot of times we, we pay lip service to wanting to cure disease and help patients, but it's always someday my discovery, someone else will go use to cure a disease. It's, it's not like I'm going to make a medicine and help this person who's on the other end of the line with me. And I think that that was a thing where I just realized like I'm not I'm not doing enough and it really hit me hard after that. I mean, I had nothing to offer her. It's just I'm sitting in academia, we're researching how to do this stuff. You know, I don't have any clinical trials to offer you. We don't have any anything that's just I had nothing. And that was really hard. And so I I felt like we should be doing more. That for me was the point where I recognized that this technology needs to leave academia if it's actually going to help people. Pharma and biotech is where drug discovery happens and, and where medicines get to patients. So I s- started looking into spinning a company out of the lab at that point. And as I was talking to potential investors, a lot of them were, were asking if I was going to join the company myself or if I was going to be like every other academic and sit in my ivory tower and let other people go do the hard and important work. You know, it's kind of an aggressive question and uh, maybe one I was not immediately prepared to answer, but also it was very fair. You know, if I truly believe in this, then I should be willing to actually go and make it happen. But, you know, my academic lab also is more than just me. There's a lot of trainees that were counting on the stability of having this research group to be able to to get to their next stage of their career and their, their life. And I, you know, I don't want to derail someone else's life. So I, I had a series of one-on-one conversations with everyone in the group where I, I kind of laid it out. You know, we've got this opportunity where some people could leave the lab and the rest of us stay on our current trajectory. Or we have this opportunity where we could all go together and really try and make a difference. And I probably shouldn't have been surprised by the result, which is that everyone unanimously was, wow, let's go do it. Right, especially if we can all stay together, I think was a was something that was really exciting for people. And so at that point, I sort of you know I felt like I had a mandate, and it also felt like kind of a stupid time to leave academia. You know, uh, I had just gotten a bunch of grants awarded. Like the lab was very well funded. I'd spent years building the lab and getting it to the point where everything was great. There was nothing pushing me out of academia, but I, there was something pulling me out, which was this opportunity and the ability to go take this team and this technology and, and actually try to make a difference. Hmm. What happened to the grants? Did they, did you have to abandon the grants then? To... I had to cancel all the grants. Wow. <laughs> it, was really, it was really sad. <laughs> wow. So they couldn't just stay with some crew people that stayed there while you started AI Proteins, huh? So there were, there were some grants that were collaborative grants okay. with other labs. And so those labs just yeah. got to get a little bit more money for their <laughs> for their efforts. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Um, and so that, that worked out well. Other grants where it was, you know, they were only only for, for my group, those ones had wow. to be canceled. And then we also had a bunch of sponsored research with different companies. Those had to all be canceled as well. Oh, man. Yeah, I can't imagine like being in that moment and having to make those calls and cancel them and at, probably at the same time wondering if this is the right move. But, I mean, you had a really inspiring opportunity and a calling that I feel like you can't help but like jump into. So that probably helps. So does that mean that you're doing clinical research now? We spent the first, I would say, year building a new drug discovery engine from scratch. Um, You know, we had an opportunity with a clean slate. We had sort of built the beta version in academia for a high throughput drug discovery engine. But here we really built the professional grade version. And that that took a year to get off the ground, even with all the folks that came with me. So Mm. there were, you know, all the postdoctoral fellows, there were seven folks uh, that all came and all the research associates as well came. And actually one of the department admins came as well. Oh, wow. Um, She's fantastic. And so the company's been around for a year and nine months. And so the last nine months we've been operating this platform at scale. And we've already created molecules that we've designed, screened, actually produced in the lab and done careful biophysics experiments and shown that they they bind to their targets like they're supposed to. And we've done that for 80 programs in nine months. And just for a little bit of scale, Pfizer has about 100 programs in all of Pfizer that are, that are in the clinic, which is, we're a scrappy little startup so I think this gives you a some sense of the potential of where this is going. Wow. 
So we are pushing our stuff forward into the clinic, but we still have another, I would say, year in change of experiments to show that the medicines are safe and effective and mm -hmm. also scaling this stuff up and manufacturing it and producing it at pharmaceutical grade and all that sort of jazz that we got to do before we can start human clinical trials. Got it. I do want to make sure that we touch on one point too that I think is really important. And that's the fact that it has the potential to make medicines more affordable. Can you talk about that? Yeah, absolutely. The mini proteins themselves are much more amenable to large-scale manufacturing and storage than other protein-based modalities. So one that a lot of folks are probably familiar with but maybe didn't know was protein is the Regeneron antibody cocktail that was used a lot during the pandemic. Regardless of your politics, I would say when our president got COVID, he was immediately given the Regeneron antibody cocktail. And that, don't know for certain, but probably played a large role in keeping the president alive. So these can be really effective medicines. But you didn't see that Regeneron antibody cocktail getting used a lot in the pandemic for a couple of reasons. One is it's pretty expensive to make antibodies. The cost of goods can be at probably best about $2,000 per gram of drug substance, which is quite costly. It's also, you know, as protein, most proteins you, you need to refrigerate, right? I mean, you refrigerate eggs and milk. Those are two foods that are full of protein. You refrigerate raw meat. So when the, you need to refrigerate protein. And that also means that a lot of the world that doesn't have access to refrigeration on a, you know, reliable refrigeration, you're not going to be able to use those medicines. And then, you know, those antibodies are also, uh, it's an intravenous administration. So that also requires pretty sophisticated medical infrastructure to provide intravenously administered medicine. That's not something you can do in a lot of parts of the world either. And it's expensive to do it, even in parts of the world like the U.S., where we have the infrastructure. All of that takes antibody medicines and makes it really something for the wealthy and the elite few. And we really want to democratize access to these next generation protein medicines. We want things that are as effective or more effective than antibodies, but are actually something that we can produce and administer at scale so that everyone can access it. And that's what mini proteins are allowing us to do. And there's a couple reasons. One is that the structures themselves, when we design them, make the medicine really, really stable. So an egg, the proteins themselves, those fragile three-dimensional shapes, they unravel when you cook them. And that's why the, like the egg white turns from clear to white when you cook an egg is that it's actually taking those balled up thing of string that's like in this really sp special shape. And when you heat it, it just kind of unravels it and it turns it into this big tangled guck. And our mini proteins, we design them super well so they don't unravel with temperature. And so you can think about it like an uncookable egg. And so the protein itself is just a lot more durable. And so we can do stuff with it, like we can dry it down into powder, and you can incubate it at high temperature. You don't need to refrigerate it. It could survive sitting in like the back of a box truck driving through the desert. Like that's the type of stuff that these can do that an antibody will never do. The other is that antibodies are mammalian proteins. Like our body makes these. These are human proteins. And you can manufacture them in big bioreactors with human cells that are pumping these things out. And one of the things with antibodies that's really important is there's multiple chains. So there's, it's actually not one protein. There's like a bunch of them that need to come together. There's four chains in an antibody. And there's also some sugars that get stuck onto them. And the sugars are really important. Also, it's not just one small sugar like sucrose. It's like a big sugar tree where, and the pattern of these sugars is also important for the function. So you have to control all that. And so all that is to say the antibodies are just really sophisticated molecules. You don't need all that sophistication. It's just there because it, it's evolutionary baggage. And a mini protein we designed to be simple. It doesn't have all this baggage. And so you don't need sophisticated production of a mini protein. We can take simple food grade yeast that you can grow in a big bioreactor. I mean, think about it like beer. I mean, beer is made with yeast. You can take yeast that are not that different from what you use to brew beer and grow it in a big chamber that's not that different from what you use to brew beer and make medicine at scale. And so the cost of goods can now be pennies per gram instead of thousands of dollars per gram. And I think that's where not only are they easier to administer and, and give to patients, the stability also unlocks the potential for just putting it in a pill. You know, your digestive tract has evolved to break apart protein and use it as food. 
that the mini proteins can be durable enough that they can survive those digestive environments and it makes it possible to actually formulate it into a pill and just eat it instead of having to have it be injected. That's really cool. And that also increases overall shelf life of the the antibody in the medicine as well, right? Whereas once you have to open the seal for anything intravenously, it has a set timer that essentially ha- runs out, right? It's amazing. Yeah, and much like your eggs and your milk have a certain amount of time they can be in the fridge before they start to go bad, antibodies are the same way. And if you can have it dry in a pill, you can also yeah sit on the shelf for a lot longer. With this transition and and into AI proteins, what would you what advice would you give to the the next generation of researchers that are now really spending a lot of time within these dry lab environments and doing computer science in a way that you know wasn't done probably when you started? It's advanced so much in the last twelve to eighteen months. And what would you tell to the next generation? Well. It's a very exciting time to be a scientist. The techniques that I learned during my training are now largely obsolete. Oh, wow. So what I would recommend is think about what do you want to accomplish? And along those lines, know that you can always change your mind. So I think a lot of people are afraid to commit to something because, oh, well, what if I you know, what if that's not the right answer? I I don't want to commit to it. It's totally fine to change directions. So if you don't pick a direction, then you don't really go anywhere. If you pick a direction and change it later, that's totally fine. You'll have gotten somewhere and then you can, you can point yourself in another, another place. So I would say, just don't be afraid of picking something and pursuing it. And then the, the other is that training should be for something. You shouldn't just get training to get trained. The whole academic research system is built around trainee labor, and trainees get compensated very poorly. So always have in mind, why am I in this training position, and what is my next step, and how is this helping me get there? Because if you don't have a clear through line to what that training is going to unlock for you, then really what you're doing, I would say, is wasting earning potential. Because you may find that you would be in the same spot if you had just decided to go work in a job. 10 years later than if you had stayed in training for an extra 10 years. And really all you did was sacrifice earning a paycheck for a decade. Did you know you were interested in AI proteins when you started? I was, I would say, always on the academic track. I didn't really strongly consider biotech or entrepreneurship. And and some of it is because I was just isolated from, from that during my PhD training it was always, you know, biotech was kind of the, the other. We didn't really interact with them. I didn't know much about it. Um, during the, my postdoctoral training was mostly that, and folks were starting to do more entrepreneurial stuff. But it actually wasn't until I moved to Boston, which is just a magical town, because it's the, the highest density of nerds, I think, on the planet. And I mean <laughs> that in the best possible way. And one of the super cool things about Boston is that the academic community and the biotech startup pharma community is really all in the same place. It's all one homogenous community, and there's lots and lots of interaction. And there's a great investment community that's here as well. And it doesn't feel like a separate camp. It feels like we're all in it together, and there's not this division anymore. And so it didn't feel quite like I was going to do a different job anymore. It just felt like I was doing the same job at a different organization. And so it made it a lot less scary. And I, I think that that's the magic of Boston. And I'm not really sure there's any place else in the world that people could have that kind of experience. Does it feel like you have other science entities outside of the AI proteins company that you feel like you can lean on? Or even if it's maybe a cultural, like we're in this together feeling as you talked about Yeah, I mean, the free exchange of ideas is super important. And also collaboration is incredibly important in science. You know, we still actually do a bunch of academic collaborations. Our company is physically located right next to Fenway Park. I can see the big Sitco sign out of the window sitting next to me. And Longwood Avenue is just a couple minute walk up the street. And, you know, Longwood Avenue is where Harvard Medical School is, Boston Children's Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Beth Israel Hospital. I mean, it's just like, it's all right there. When I was in academia, I was at, my primary appointment was at the Institute for Protein Innovation, but I also had co-faculty appointments at Boston Children's Hospital in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and, and Harvard Med. 
And I actually managed to hold on to a 0% effort appointment at Children's Hospital. And, and so I, we still have some collaborations there, and I get to interact with that research community. It's fantastic. And I also founded and, and helped co-organize a group in Boston called the Boston Protein Design and Modeling Club. And so this is just a gathering of protein nerds in the greater Boston area. We, since the pandemic, we've actually gone online, and so we, we actually have pretty good-sized online following now. And this is a seminar series, and it's folks from both academia and biotech and industry that all get together once a month to just share science and eat pizza and drink beer. And it's a great time. Chris, you touched on the academia versus biotech and how that dynamic has significantly changed over the years. In the past, it seems like it was two different entities, two different driving factors of why you would go one or the other. And the introduction of dry labs and computational sciences Do you think that that's a driving factor for pulling those together and then opening up the door to allowing you to really generate the, what'd you say, uh, the 80 different programs in nine months in comparison to what some other big pharmas do in their creation? Computation has, without a doubt, accelerated everything that we do. Along with the increase in computational power has also come a lot of cool techniques that enable us to make massive numbers of measurements in a single experiment, like millions upon millions upon millions of measurements in one experiment. And that's obviously too much for any one human to actually look at. And so computation has been really critical in being able to analyze all of those data. Honestly, a lot of even just the measurement in those experiments requires lots of computation often as well. And so that's been a huge accelerator. I think the biotechnology in general is a field that's maturing. And so in the early days when it doesn't work most of the time, that's when it's still a kind of an academia because it, you need to be able to actually create products. I mean, at the end of the day, if you're not a university, you have to be able to make money at some point. And so there has to be a useful product at the end. The technology has to work in order to be able to actually create So I think that's part of it is the transition for biotechnology out of academia has been driven by the fact that this technology is broadly very useful. It can do all sorts of great, amazing things. And that transition has certainly been accelerated and the usefulness of biotechnology has been accelerated through computation. Very, very cool. We've been working with you guys for a while and you have the lemur laptops Are you fully a Linux-based shop for what you're doing or as much as you can be overall with the principles that come with that and science combination? I mean, Linux is fantastic. I'm, I'm talking to you from a lemur right now. We use Linux laptops really all from System76 for the, the end user workstations. Our HPC is all Linux-based one of the big things in biotech is a piece of infrastructure called the Laboratory Information Management System, or LIMS. And this is something that all modern biotechs and many pharmas are racing to catch up to do, is essentially a big database that, that you store all your data in. And it seems kind of obvious that you'd want this, but you know, in the past, a lot of this was kept in paper lab notebooks and PowerPoint presentations and screenshots, and it wasn't, wasn't very well organized. So we also built our own our own limbs, and that's all Linux software. And we've got Linux servers in the lab that scrape data off instruments every night and upload it to our HPC where it's backed up into the cloud. So, you know, super redundant. And all of that is done all through Linux systems, you know, from the firewall to the limb server to the workstations to how we interface with it, everything. So what's next for AI proteins? I mean, you guys, it's a year and nine months. You've accomplished... a tremendous amount in that period of time. What's the the next yeah. year? I almost want to follow up in a year or so when you said you might be running experiments and to see what you have going on when you're at that point. Yeah. So we are pushing our own programs through into the clinic. And so we hope that we'll be gearing up for human clinical trials one year from now. Our, our goal is in 2025 to have molecules in human clinical trials. We couldn't possibly handle bringing all of the medicines that we can design and create into the clinic ourselves. It takes an organization the size of Pfizer to do 100 clinical trials, and we've got a long ways to go before we're the size of Pfizer. So a big part of our corporate strategy is partnering. We want to work with other other groups, other biotech companies, other startups, large pharma companies, 
everyone who's trying to bring medicine to patients and make a difference in the world. And we can accelerate the process of creating that medicine, but the process of actually doing a clinical trial still requires some innovation to be able to scale, to keep up with the rate that we can, that we can design new medicines. So that's going to have to be done in, in collaboration with others, which is fantastic, right? Bringing humans together to do more good. That's uh, one of the things we're also really looking forward to. I mean, the only other curiosity I would have is if there's any custom layouts or ways that you're interfacing with POP that might be useful to someone who is maybe just starting out in computing and maybe they have their first System76 machine or just trying POP for the first time and they're entering this field. Maybe there's some tricks or layouts or some customization that you find that your team is using. And there might not be, but curious if there is. The thing that I love most about System76 hardware and, and Pop! OS is that it just works. I've been using Linux for a very long time, tried lots of different distros. In the past, when I was in academia, during my postdoctoral studies, they handed me a Mac, and I just really was not having a good time with it. So I made a reverse Hackintosh, where I <laughs> scrubbed off the Mac OS and put Ubuntu on there. And whether it's a less controversial Linux install, like on a you know Lenovo hardware or whatever, there's always something that's you always got to tweak it. It's always like every now and then a little something that goes wrong and you got to spend a day fixing it or installing some other patch. Or And we just haven't had that experience with Pop! OS and System76. That just We don't have to ever think about it. It's not like a DIY sort of setup. It's just very robust and all that stuff is just kind of taken care of. So I would say we don't do a lot of customization and that's a good thing because we mm-hmm. don't have to. <laughs> it just doesn't get in the way and, it, and allows us to just actually focus on what we need to, which is designing proteins. Yeah, we just talked to a, another student who was starting up her education. She's going for, I think she said electrical engineering, and she asked her school if she could use Linux. And they told her, no, you're probably going to need to use Windows because of compatibility. And so she used Linux anyway. She's using uh, System76, Pop! OS, and has had no issues, same thing. So I think it's just one of those things where you, the majority assumes that it, there's compatibility issues and there hasn't been. Well, Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a, a pleasure to chat with you to hear about AI proteins, where you came from, what's next, and and how you're able to accomplish it within a Linux environment. And the pleasure. Thanks so much for the invitation. I had a blast chatting with you guys today. This has been the System76 Transmission Log. For more inspiration, check out the website and follow us on social media. On your descent back to Earth, please keep your hands and feet inside the transport beam at all times. Captain sign-off, in transmission.